Even in Kilkenny, with its good record for preserving historic buildings, there's now only one remaining example of that ancient institution, the all-male pub. Pat Gleason's has been a sanctuary for men for bordering on 200 years. A pub in the good old style, and with a strict code of conduct for its clientele. No cursing, no slate, no gambling, and no women. Pat's is the epitome of the character pub, and it's full of characters, some of them drinking here for 40 years. I remember the pint at Tuppence. I drank at a Tuppence in McGrath's of Parliament Street. I was only 16 years of age playing handball. And I bought a pack of wood bines for a penny. Five. Playing handball? Yes. Looking at Pear Wells from all the trust of Johnny. That's right, Johnny. And, uh, but I only drank a bottle of stout that time. The lads was hardier than me, but for when I see them drinking, I drank too. And I drank from that. I never stopped drinking since. <laughs> <laughs> and you make it out of ten pints yeah. per week for the last fifty years. That would have been it. Five thousand pounds. Uh, five thousand. Five thousand. Five thousand. Was it money well spent? Money well spent, the greatest thing in the world. Was it yet? No, I never had a doctor only for the flu there a partner ago and another particular train too sick after beer. <laughs> I drank a long time ago. I was I was surprised when Rusty fit was the point. And I was working. I took the sick Bob my grub and I could go in and have a pint. Then I got a, not a few chances. <coughs> you got a hard one too now. You only three bob a pint now. You got a four two and nine here, but it, it, but but down the town you play three bob for. I come in here since I was six years of age, but not for to drink beer, <laughs> <laughs> but for groceries. And the man that owned the place at that time was Pat Leeson's uncle, a man by the name of Pat Welch. And I often went home to my mother. And I cry him. When you come up for the bread, he get on to you. Martin, he call everyone. And he get on to you. And he say, Martin, my bread wouldn't go with the butter that your mother have. When you wouldn't be buying the butter here, you see. <laughs> <laughs> and I get all pushed up and I go home crying. And my mother would come up and she'd give him horror all over it, so she would. <laughs> I was thinking of times on Friday, Stephen. Oh, no, no, you're Never not. Never even Because the portal was there to them over the wood. Is it different now, do you think? Ah, it's his old, old contains, old tin stuff. And what's wrong with that? <laughs> it's not natural. <laughs> <laughs> but wh why wouldn't it be natural? How could it? Or, 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 or what's good over containers? The only thing good over containers Take now the tin to food that's going to do. It's the same thing with the portal. You got nothing to put our country on, only all the wood. Why, Johnny? What, 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 what would you think of the... You're drinking a pint there now. I mean, is it not up to standard? Well, sure, I'm getting used to it now. <laughs> International Brotherhood is the theme of Woodstock 78, where 5,000 Scouts from 22 countries have gathered to celebrate 70 years of the Scout Association of Ireland. The first troops were started in Greystones and Dundalk in 1908, and there are now 10,500 members, boys and girls with 8,500 Catholic, 1,500 Protestant and the rest of other denominations. Their history is a proud one, declared President Hillary when he opened the week-long camp this morning in the presence of ambassadors from seven countries. Seventy years ago, the first scout troops were formed in Ireland. Some say Greystones had its troop before Dublin. And during the week there will be international events and discussions on the future of scouting, with particular emphasis on involving and helping the handicapped in the movement. The Catholic Boy Scouts of Ireland, which last year celebrated 50 years of its founding, were present also today, including their chief scout, who is a vice president of the Scout Association. 
Northern Ireland representatives were there too, and both the Irish Girl Guides organisations. This is the Verome Dockyard in Cove, County Cork. The workers there are highly skilled, many of them trained in Holland. The ships they build are renowned for the quality of their craftsmanship, but on Thursday night last when we visited the shipyard, the men weren't building ships because having finished their normal day's work, they'd stayed on at the yard to do more work. They were giving their time and energy, free of charge, to help old people in Kilkenny, over 100 miles away. These Cork men are members of a group of voluntary workers called Christian Community Action, or CCA. The work they're doing is for Freshford, a small village of 1,300 people, nine miles from Kilkenny. This old disused schoolhouse is being renovated and converted into a home for old people. The building of the home, everything from knocking enormous lumps of limestone out of the walls to putting in an extra floor, has been done by voluntary workers from Freshford itself, from the surrounding Kilkenny area, and from places as far away as Donegal and Cork, and this is where the men in Verome come in. Part of their work in CCA involves travelling around the country to give their skilled help wherever it's needed, and at the moment they're giving a hand with the tricky part of the Freshford project, the things the other volunteers aren't equipped to do. Sister Patricia and Sister Beatrice are two nuns who, in the course of their social work in Freshford, have begun to realise that because of age, illness or loneliness, many of the old people in the area shouldn't have to live on their own in remote rural areas, and neither should they have to go to county homes where they might well feel even lonelier. So it was decided to build a home for them in Freshford within their own community. They decided to renovate the old schoolhouse, but to do it professionally would have cost £18,000. So they tried voluntary workers instead. What have they done to this old schoolhouse so far? It's been utilised as a home for elderly people. An actual home, home for elderly people. Yeah. Yes, we hope when it's complete we'll be able to accommodate 12. They'll have 12 individual rooms. This was a very high building yeah. as you see from the front so the, our voluntary workers mm -hmm. have done tremendous work on it because yeah. it, as you see it's cut limestone so they had to knock yeah, all these out with chisels there. and hammers mm -hmm. and it was all done at night time they'll have a complete bed sitting room for them they'll have their independence yes um, they'll have cooking facilities if they're capable, they can have their own morning meal and evening meal. We'll provide a midday meal for them. I see. We'll have yeah. downstairs, we'll have a recreation room and a dining room. Mm -hmm. Upstairs, six bedrooms and the bathroom. And I think you're going to build out the back as well, are At you? the back, there will be a new kitchen and six rooms, bedrooms on the flat. The amount of work that's been done here is, is quite remarkable because it's all voluntary help, isn't all it? All voluntary help. Well, now, yes. who are the people who have done this? Are Local they? people, mostly. We have one man, Bricklayer, who's been coming out from Kilkenny also, and a man from a neighbouring parish from Johnstown. He has been coming in three nights a week. And as you see, it was done at night time and on Saturdays. You're having voluntary workers coming up from Cork over the Easter weekend. Well, now, wh what's the need for this? Are there not enough voluntary workers in Freshford or in the Kilkenny area? Yes. Well, we had come to the stage here when we needed um, professional people, mm -hmm. when we needed tradesmen, like plasterers and carpenters and such like. So we asked Father Duffy if they could do anything for us. He got in touch with his voluntary group in Cork mm -hmm. and they said they would be delighted to help out. So they're making the um, wardrobes and units for us in Cork. They're bringing them here on Holy Saturday and coming Saturday night and they'll work Sunday and Monday. We were in Freshford on the Tuesday of last week. On the Thursday we went to Cork, where we found the Verome Dockyard a hive of activity, as the voluntary workers got everything ready for installation in the Freshford schoolhouse over the Easter weekend. Fourteen of them were travelling up on Saturday to spend the weekend working on the project, and accommodation and food were to be provided free of charge by local people, as is the custom on all CCA projects. Next week, another group will arrive from Cork to take up where they left off. Dominic, what are you out down here? I'm just playing last check up on the, the unit, the vanity well, what unit. What sort of a unit is this? It's a vanity unit, you I know, see, with yeah. um, cupboards and wash basin. And, and what's this behind us here? This is a wardrobe, double wardrobe with a series of shelves. And there'll be coat hangers. Ah, I see. Yeah. How many of these here. are you making completely? Um, we've made seven wardrobes and nine, nine vanity units. And, and they're all going up to Kilkenny? Oh, are you travelling up with them? 
I am, yes, now I'm just second, on the second turn. Oh, are there, are there two minutes of people going? Yeah. And, and what will yeah. be, be involved up there? Is it just installing these or is there more to be done? Installing those, there's more to be done on right. What and else? There's partitions to be erected and ceilings to be erected. There's a big recreation room, you know. Yeah, and, uh, I've seen that. The recreation, there's uh, acoustic tiles going on the recreation ceiling and... Uh, and that's all your job? And then we'll get around to it anyway. Good. Well, listen, wh what is it that makes you come in here uh, after work and, and do this kind of thing? I'd say this Father Hugh Duffy myself, I don't know, it was marvellous. We get a wonderful response, really. We must have had um, about 30 different joiners and four nights. Just people, all people who work? completed this, the whole lot of the farm. The whole nine units? Yeah. Nine Are they all people who work here during the day? Yes. What do you do yourself? I'm the um, foreman joiner. I see. So you're doing the same kind of work, are you, oh that yes. you'll be doing during the oh day yes, anyway? more or less. Does, does, do you find that a bit boring, doing the same thing at night? Well, not really, you know. I, I don't think so. If we, you know, I find that when the lads aren't getting paid for it, they would be much more hard, much harder at work. How do you, what do you do during the day here in the, in the dockyard? I'm in charge of machines. Machines? Yes. Just here in this Just in this here in this apartment, yes. Yeah. Well, how many evenings a week do you come to work for, for this project? Uh, about two evenings. I see. Two, two evenings, yes. Uh, we're kind of working at the moment for the dockyard for the other two evenings. On, on ordinary on overtime? Yes. On and overtime. the other two evenings then yes. you're in here? Why do you do it? Well, I suppose it's a good cause and uh, <coughs> I have, my mother is, is 77 herself and perhaps if I wasn't at home or my brother as well, I'd like to have someone help, them, help my mother. Mm -hmm. I think people at that age would want to be helped. Dan, what are you doing here? Oh, <laughs> we're getting this ca those cabinets ready for Father Duffy for some job in, in Kilkenny. Well, what, what exactly is this, this cabinet here? Well, this is actually... Um, Covered with, it's connected with a wardrobe. You see, they put the two of them in the one, in the one yeah. room. Are, are so you going to go? Are you going to go up to Kilkenny to install it? Oh yes, I'll go up. All right, yes. Have I you have you been travelling before with the group? Yes, we have travelled before. I've been um, up in Sligo with for um, for the, the, the handicapped, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been down Castle Martyr too for the school. We were um, preparing the um, classrooms and the the. the um, concert halls and mm -hmm. things like that. It's a general work, like for the uh, Tell me, pupils down there, you see. What makes you give up your free time to do this kind of thing? Well, I don't know. It's hard to say, really, I suppose. Uh, I suppose the way I look at it sometimes, that, uh, well, you've got nothing better to do sometimes and you could waste it all. You know, you could mm -hmm. waste your time more at times. So I felt, and it's really for a good cause. Four years ago, Father Hugh Duffy helped build homes for young couples in Glencullum Kill. When he came to Cork, he founded Christian Community Action. Well, it's a form of uh, Christian witness, which is uh, practical and meaningful in today's terms. Not like the uh, Cloud Cuckoo world Christianity that we've been used to in the past. Yeah. Well, what in, in, in this particular case, we're here in the Verone Dockyard. Now, yeah. are these... Does this comprise the whole group of Christian Community Action? No. It certainly comprises the nucleus. We have about 200 volunteers from the dockyard, I would say. But we have uh, lots of other volunteers throughout Ireland. But what's uh, unusual about this particular group is that, that they're all skilled workers, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, and so forth. Well, what difference does that make to the kind of work they do? I mean, how, what is it that distinguishes them from other voluntary groups? Well, uh, the fact that they're all skilled workers and that they can, and that they are prepared to uh, give their time free and skill free to a worthy cause is something I think very distinctive. Well, are you been involved in other projects? The, you've built um, a place in Sligo and you've restored part of Castle Martyr. What made you think that this would work? I mean, what what was it that made you think that these men would be willing to do well, it? Well, uh, I suppose uh, I had the uh, belief, if you like, that Christianity is uh, something worth presenting to people and it is worth asking people to do this type of work for a really worthy cause and I just took the chance and asked them and they responded and responded wonderfully. One could really have asked for a more picturesque setting for an arts week such as this in this quaint old Norman town. And it's been a week of music and literature and exhibitions. You won't see Robert Balla's revealing exhibit in the Long Gallery of Kilkenny Castle but you will see other fantastic kites specially created for this arts week.
It's hoped that the kites will all be flown tomorrow. The entire collection will move from the long gallery to the skies over Kilkenny. But of course, this is only one of numerous exhibitions in the town of the visual arts. Shops and pubs and churches, the sacred and the profane have been pressed into service as art galleries and concert halls. The Ronnie Scott's Jazz Concert was in the long gallery. Kilkenny has, of course, a long literary tradition. Dean Swift, when he was just plain little Jonathan Swift, went to school here. So did other writers and philosophers. And many others have been associated with the town over the centuries. The incredible programme of classical concerts and recitals was mainly in the fine old cathedral and churches. This year there are no poetry readings. Instead, noted novelists were invited to read their work. Don Roberts, one of the organisers, explains. Well, Derek, we've had the leading Irish poets here. We had Mr Montague, we had Seamus Heaney. Um, last year we had some foreign poets reading. We have, as it were, almost exhausted the modern Irish poet. And this year we thought it would be an excellent opportunity to give some Irish novelists an opportunity to read from their work. Uh, it was an experiment, of course, but it's proved extremely successful. One of last year's readers came to Kilkenny this year as a visitor, celebrated Irish poet John Montague. Really the most, um, the most powerful music uh, girl experience of the week uh, was, I think, Schoenberg, was, uh, was Pierre Lunaire. And I think it's a great to chose something uh, about Ireland and the changes in Ireland that uh, an audience could gather in, um, in Kilkenny here to, hear, to hear one of the great masterpieces of, of 20th century music. Barony fought very much on his toes. To the world outside, it was just Aintree Grand National Day. But here in Kilkenny, it was also Big Steel Deal Day. And they're under starters' orders for the 1977 National. All good fun for a good charity. In handing over a cheque here for £600 to you, Michael, uh, on to the Parents and Friends Society of St. Patrick. £600 from yeah, Kilkenny so Lions Club right. to St. Patrick's Special School for Moderately Mentally Handicapped Children run by the Sisters of Charity. £600, that's the amount left after the big steel deal. Uh, frankly, we, we felt we got off reasonably light. Um, we thought it could have, we could have been hit for a little bit more. And this looks like it, they're off. And spit an image on the far side is the first to show of that group and Boom Docker on the near side with Andy Pandy and Nerio right up with him and San Willen and Brown Admiral. And over on but the in the side. big steel deal, there were just three runners. And of course, the l and supermarket. Instead of Beecher's, it was the butter counter. First prize in the Lions Club raffle was three minutes in the supermarket with a trolley to steal all you like. Second prize was three minutes with a hand basket. Third prize, three minutes and your bare hands. That went to Kathleen Martin. <laughs> Many people who bought tickets, and indeed something over 6,000 people supported this venture, um, indicated that if they had a go at it, their, their, their take home would be 200, 250 pounds. Basket at the ready, Mrs. Margaret McAvoy, second prize. How do you feel after that now? Oh, I thought 
forgot the water. I forgot the water. You have another two minutes. <laughs> Well, now we're just about to see the final total. How much do you think it is? It's clear. Give us a guess now. A 20. 20 pounds. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was run before somewhere in the States. And um, there, in fact, they weren't too happy with the results because, like here, it was for a local charity. And uh, there, the people had done their homework in a big way and attacked the meat counter and uh, came out with huge piles of food. And in the end of the day, there wasn't an awful lot of money left over for the, for the charity involved. Which was your fear in this case? It was our fear because <coughs> the... Well, the problem was, of course, to raise some money for a, a deserving local charity. This one in question, uh, our difficulty was to help them in a urgent painting job. And um, the money simply is not available from public funds. Now, there's no fault, at least it's not for me, to uh, blame anybody in question, other than the question, is this the way, uh, as a nation, we should be looking after people in need? Well, when thinking of a mentally handi ha handicapped child, when thinking of his training, you've got to think that you've, you have to teach these children things that you take for granted in a normal child. And we concentrate a lot on sensory training. That is the, the training of the eyes, the ears, the nose, the hands, and taste. And for instance, visual training, that's training of the eyes. To a handicapped child, if they look at a picture, sometimes it's all jumbled up they can't distinguish foreground from background. Now, just for instance, take this book. You can see a boy and a girl here. Now, to us, that's very clear. We can distinguish the boy and the girl from the field and the sky. But to a handicapped child, this often is mixed up. So it's our job, through various methods, to try and help them to distinguish things, the boy and the girl from the background. And another area which is very important is hearing, to discriminate between certain sounds. Often a handicapped child can't distinguish between sounds and we have various exercises to help him do this and one is sound boxes we call them and we have little things like this and there are various sounds in each box and they rattle them and try to match the sounds that are the same now this one now we know that they are quite different sounds but a handicapped child often can't recognize the difference so it's our job to try and teach them this. Can we just uh, announce that this is the winner, Mrs. Wright, from, from Tallistown. Um, and she's got three minutes to get as much as she can, or as little as she can, into the basket. Now for the big one, the trolley. Mrs. Edith Wright. The housewife's dream. Take what you like, and the dearer the better.
And this is the last ditch, the fourth from home. And Red Ram's in the lead, a lot of loose horses after him. And Red Ram with a tremendous chance of winning his third national. He jumps it clear of Jeff down by. He's getting the most tremendous cheer from the crowd. They're winning him home now. Well, how do you think you did? Terrific! <laughs> Give us a guess. Uh, 60. 60 pounds. 60 pounds. Kilkenny's Brian Cody explains the skill of catching the ball. When catching the ball, it is important to catch it with your fingers and not in the palm of your hand because if catching with the palm it tends to bounce off and sometimes you fail to hold it. Also it is very important to protect your hand with your hurley because another player will, will be pulling on the ball. Loving memory of Patrick and Ellen Morrissey, Bally Duff, in Teard at Inish Teague, their son Patrick, member of the Sinn Féin party, 1914-1921, died, and there's no date, aged, and there's no age. And there's a very good reason for that, because standing beside his own headstone is Patrick Morrissey. Patrick, why have you put up this headstone here before you've died yourself? Well, I thought that I would. When I had all the money collected, that I would put it up myself, because if I left it to my sons to put it up, I should never go up. Never. They, they, never. They wouldn't bother with those. And you wanted, you wanted your own grave to, to be marked with a stone? Yes. So, yes. so what yes. did you do? You collected some, you saved up the money for oh, it? I saved you? up the money for it. Yes, I did. I did. And did that take you long? Oh, it did. It took me a couple of years. Mm. It did. It took me, I suppose, about, about two years. Yes. And you had it, you had it, Car. Well, if I was working constant, I was working every day then, you see? Ah. You're a good age now, of course. A good age? Yes. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm 75. And how many years ago was it you decided that you wanted to have this? Oh, when I was getting, myself getting better up. Mm. Ah. And you, you went, you I went... I said, the best thing I could do, I was saying myself, you're getting old, no paddy, I says, and the best thing you could do, is to put up a memory stone to yourself before you get too old. You must be and if I leave the money to the young generation, says I, it will never go up, which it wouldn't. I could assure you that, it wouldn't. You must be proud of the fact that you were a member of the Sinn Féin party since, oh, yes, you, since you yes. put it on this. Yes, yes I was. So you're, 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 a, you're an old soldier, as it were? An old soldier, yes. Well, would, 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 would your old comrades not have done something about it, do you think? The old comrades? Yeah. Well, I'm sure they would. I'm sure they would, but... Well, they won't come with us. That'll be the old crowd. That's right. Well, they're few and far between now, all my old comrades. And the young generation, you know, you couldn't trust them. It'd be very hard to trust them. So you went off to have this made. You had it carved, I think, in Carlo, was it? Oh, yes, Carlo. This man has it, has the fact that he belonged Carlo. Yes. He's from, he's from the place called Paul Stone himself. He well, lives out there. What, what did he think when you went and said, look, I want a, a gravestone and I want it I'm all done even though I'm, I'm not gone yet myself? What did he say? Did he say, are you not a bit previous? Oh, no. He said, surely you have to have it. Yes. I asked him what price to be and he told me. And as far as you're concerned, whatever the price was, it was worth the money. Oh, it was worth the money. Yeah. It was. It was. Because it will be there. 
for all time when I won't be there. Yeah, it will. Did you did you ever hear the expression, "Muckins catching," that if you if you do something, it might oh, bring you bad luck? Oh, oh, I did. Yes, I have that. I and does that, that not, does that not bother you? Five years ago, I heard that. Does that it not much. bother you then that you put up a gravestone to yourself while you're still alive? That it might, uh, it might hurry on the day. Oh, it might take me away. It oh might. no, I never dream of them dream things at all. No, no. Live as long as I can and die when I can not help it. <laughs> yes, that's my policy. Number of failures. Um, no, it's, it's, it's hard to remember just at the moment, but we failed certainly with providing a, a proper occupation for, for uh, mothers of families, providing uh, income for them. We failed in uh, tying up uh, speech therapy. We tried this and we didn't get it, we didn't get it going, and it's, it's very badly needed. Um, we failed in getting um, an overall committee that would, um, would uh, steer the thing through. Um, what else? Oh, at least several others I, I can't recall. Oh yeah, a very important one, John, which I, I think I ought to say on this programme is that by trying to house all the itinerants indiscriminately, we made a grievous mistake. There are some families of itinerants for, that are not capable of being housed, and at this stage I'm wondering if it's a wise thing at all not uh, if it's a wise thing at all to attempt to desegregate the itinerants. They have a culture of their own that should have kept and we didn't recognise this in time. Mr Lenny, tell us what, what use it was to you to be in a house uh, instead of on the Oh side. yeah, it was very different all right. Because when we moved in here, Dave, when we were out on the road, you see, we hadn't, like, we have the comfort we have here now. See, we're out in the cold and all, you know. We used to have to light the fire out on the road, you see. Cool and we had just eat in the caravan to be cooked. But when we moved in here then we had a great pleasure. But a nice bit of heat and a bit of comfort and everything, do you know? We got to settle down. Did you miss anything? I know. Don't miss nothing off the road anyhow, I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> do not. It was very good. It was a great exchange. Did many of your friends from the road settle down as well? Should sure, they nearly all settle down now, every part, every country. Get here or there and tell you where they're all making new houses for them and everything. Nearly all fixed in. It's better for them, a lot better. It's better for the poor children, you know, because they can get education, get school and everything. Your husband, did he manage to get a job when he settled, when he came in here? Ah, uh, no, he's not working, something. Only on the doctor's care, he's not working, you know. He's able to work. Did you get any chance at all to do anything during the year? Ah, uh, he didn't, no, no. Uh, he don't bother, like, with that. That's the thing, he was told not to work, do you know? They don't bother then with the work. So you have a, a nice, comfortable house and you're allowed yes, to have it? Yes, very grand. Mm. Very nice. Very nice neighbours, every side of us. Yeah. Not to have, too. I tease you, really. Very nice. Well, we don't put in or out nobody, do you know? That's the only thing. Pass in and out. Mind our own business. <laughs> Sister Stan, you're involved in family casework. That's the official phrase. What's, what, what's behind that? What do you do? Well, family casework is one of these terms that could refer to anything from supplying first communion outfits to the most intensive uh, work with families who have deep emotional problems. So I deal with all kinds of families. They may be materially in need or they may be emotionally in need. And uh, this may mean giving them material help. It may mean very long-term intensive work with the parents and the parents and their children. How many, uh, give, give us an idea of the scope of that work in Kilkenny. How many people have you got? And, uh, l l for instance, give us an idea of your day, of a day. Well, it would be very difficult <laughs> to describe a day, because once you plan a day, it's bound to be upset. Uh, uh, if I plan today, for instance, it could so happen that this morning a family could come to me where maybe the wife has walked out, or the, f or the, the husband has walked out, leaving the rest of the family. My work, I could spend the whole day with them, helping uh, them to clarify what was happening. That often takes a long time because often families don't know what's happening in their own family. They can't see it clearly, but they can't see it objectively. And a lot of my work it has to do with clarifying their problem, helping them to see it as it really is, helping them to see their part in it, and then helping them to accept it and to come to terms with it and to resolve it if possible. And just back behind them, 
Chunky O'Brien, and also back there is Sean Murphy. There we are now, the lineup, and everything set now as the cameraman get the heck out of there. And the game is on, and it's John Connolly. This is Pat Lawler for Kilkenny. P.J. Malloy after him, but it's still Pat Lawler. Joe Clark. That's Pat Lally. And this is Chunky O'Brien, all alone. And a lovely shot from inside the 40 yards. And it's a Kilkenny point by Chunky O'Brien, his second point of the game. Kilkenny two points, Galway one, five and a half minutes gone in this first half. And another long puck out now. Ball just won't come up. Hit away over the far side by Joe McDonough. This is P.J. Malloy. And P.J. shot is high and it's over the bar. P.J. Malloy coming across from the far side of the field, getting that ball into the center and sending it over without any doubt whatsoever. Kilkenny two points, Galway two. Six minutes gone. Kilkenny are doing it today. Kieran Purcell again trying to grab a ball there, but can't. And that was an unnecessary type of trip there by Kieran Purcell. And uh, personal foul, how are you? That is a free for Galway from their own 50-yard line, Sean Silk to take it. And what a belt on that ball. P.J. Quarter gets it into his hand. Across to Frank Burke in front of the goal. Frank just shot the goal! A goal! A shot and into the back of the net. Well, Frank may have missed two sitting points, but he certainly got that goal. Galway won three, Kilkenny three points, and we make it about 18 minutes gone in this first half. Our stopwatch says 14 minutes gone, second half. That's Jerry Coon, the scorer, and the scoreboard says one goal and 15 points for Kilkenny, two goals and six points for Galway, or 18 points to 12. Parcel. And this is Pat Delaney with the ball, he takes a shot, and the goalkeeper's got it out, he's got it out, and here's it out the free, it doesn't matter what happens now, it's another penalty, Eddie Kerr sent that one in, but there was another penalty, what a save that was, and here it is, it's pretty near the end line, it's scooped out, and now Eddie Kerr is just going to take the free. Standing over the ball. Here it comes. This time it's gone. It's a goal. Eddie, Eddie Kerr, the scorer. Eddie Kerr, the scorer. Crashing it into the left corner of the net. And that makes the score. Kilkenny, two goals and 15 points. Galway, two goals and six. 16 minutes gone. And Mick Lanigan and Johnny McGovern and the Kilkenny mentors delighted with what they see and what they hear because there goes the full-time whistle. And Kilkenny have won the All-Ireland final, have won their 20th All-Ireland title. And Billy Fitzpatrick, 21-year-old Billy, holds that trophy high. In the early part of this century, a coal mine was opened in the Castle Comer area near Kilkenny. At its peak, it gave jobs to a thousand people and produced about 160,000 tons of anthracite coal every year. But then things went bad, and the people who were looked upon as Bolsheviks and all sorts of rebels bent on the destruction of Castle Comer, the Catholic Church, Ireland, etc., found themselves out of a job. But here, still in the Castle Comer area, in a remote field, a remarkable thing is going on because three men have sunk a 40-foot shaft and now they are taking coal out of it the hard way, day by day, by hand.
John, can I interrupt the good work? What an extraordinary contraption. Your engine, actually, and I'm sure that's seen better times in another place. Oh, it has, yeah. The duck was belonged to a Cortina. A Cortina? Above the 1972 Cortina crashed one. And so you decided to use it as your hauling equipment? Yeah, well, we worked for uh, about three or four months, we worked by hand. We actually wound the, the boxes up by hand, you know. What, hold it up? Uh, put, yeah, yeah. Just um, pulling it through? Yeah, well, if it wasn't so deep then, we were just sinking the... I mean, you know, it was maybe 20 feet deep. Now, is there any danger attached to this machinery and its use? Well, there is, yeah, yeah. You could get wound into the gears, you could... If something broke there, it could fall back in someone, but... Tell me, how much petrol would you use in a week with this hauling equipment? Mm, four or five gallons. That would be as Economical. much? Economical. Economical is right. Yeah. Well, now, l let me ask you about this. We are in a fairly remote field. How did you know that there was coal down here? Well, I didn't actually know. So my brother, Peter, he's the coal bug. He chases it all over. He, was, he had maps and all the data concerning you... the coal fields. Well, Peter, to me, that's an awfully deep hole. What is it, 40 feet down? Yeah, 40 feet. I understand that you dug that out personally. Yes. There was no other way of getting it out. There was no other way, only just... As the other, when you have no money, you have to do it. You can employ no one else to do it, or you can't employ the equipment for to do it. So well, it's... how did you get the hundreds of tons of stuff that must have come out of that? How did you get it up? You fill it into this bucket, 500 hours at a time, and you haul it to bank. You heal it out, and you go back down again. And what kind of implements were you working with? Well, just a shovel and an ordinary pick. And then you came out and pulled it out by hand, by rope? Yeah. Um, uh, how long back in your family does mining go as a tradition? Uh, hundreds of years. My grandfather worked in the north of England in coal mines a hundred years ago. And you worked in the local coal mines? Yeah, every one of them. Why did you choose this particular spot and, let's say, not 50 yards north, east, west or south of it? Well, from the money I had, I knew that we had to hit the coal at 40 to 50 feet because we wouldn't have any more money to go any further. So we knew that the coal was deep in one in 40. So this was the spot that we get at that depth. Peter, how did you and, and uh, the other two get the money, actually, just to... Um, there must be thousands of pounds involved in this much. How did you get that money together? Well, we saved up for a long, long time for the start of this venture. We had one chance to, if we got the coal, if not, we'd be saving up for another four or five years, even to go this far. Now, the coal that you bring up, and there's a great bucket of it behind you, how exactly do you sell that? Just broke and screened, and the people come here and buy it. We could, sell, we could sell 100 tonne a day if we had it. How many tonnes a day, actually, are you bringing up? We're only bringing up about a tonne a day. If you had more money and more people, what could you expand your tonnage, your daily tonnage, to? About 40 tonne a week, at the beginning. Like. Now, the people who come here to the pit head and buy from you, how much a tonne do they pay for it? Seventy pound a ton. Does that burn in cookers and does it burn in the open grate? Yeah. It burns in anything. Cookers are open grate. The government has proved that marginal reserves of coal, which is a foot high, they have thirteen million tons in this area. They have just just twenty million tons out of it. That's proved since nineteen nineteen sixty one. Well Pierce, I believe you were the first man to buy a bag of coal here at the pit head. Yes. Sir. When was that? Well, I'm not really sure now, because it could be back... Well, it's over a year ago, anyway, it's a year and a half. How did you know that the lads actually were mining here? Well, I met them in a conversation, and I heard it going about. Yeah. And I know that uh, Kesselcoma coal was good, and Skihana coal was good, and it couldn't be bad here, no sulphur, no nothing. It's perfect. So what did you do? You got in the car and came along one I day? I took the car and took away 200. I have 200 there now, going yeah. away and I found it perfect. Well, there you are, the story of three people with an indomitable will to survive in an area where other people said coal was dead. Just before leaving, one last thing. I've got in my hands here a little letter from the National Coal Board, Scottish South Area, who did a test on the anthracite here. And what they came up with was that the anthracite is about the second best quality in all of Europe. It makes one wonder what the government should be doing about Castlecoma. <laughs>